I wish I could believe what David has just said, but uh, having been assigned as the warm-up act for Carl Guyberson, I have been truly humbled. Uh, this morning I want to introduce you to what many of you probably assume is a major problem in this area of science and religion, and that is the apparent antagonism between talk of God and, and talk of science. And I want to briefly put this uh, development in historical consequences because it's not nearly as bad as people uh, think uh, it, it is. So from antiquity through the 17th century and into the 18th century, Students of nature, typically called philosophers, uh, often tried to reduce the number of supernatural interventions in understanding nature. So even in Greek antiquity and the Christian Middle Ages, there would be comments about people who overdid the attribution of storms or unusual events, eclipses, to the gods or to, to God. So there was a tendency among students of nature, typically called natural philosophers, uh, to stress natural explanations rather than supernatural explanations. But natural philosophy did not rule out appeals to the supernatural. In fact, the leading natural philosopher of all time, Isaac Newton, explicitly invoked God in his uh, principles of natural philosophy and said that, that one of the goals of natural philosophy was to understand uh, God. But this all changed substantially roughly in the years between 1750 and 1850. And it's no coincidence that that is the very period when science was invented. You noticed I haven't talked about science before this period. It's natural philosophy. The goals were different. The methods uh, were different. But about the, the middle of the 18th century, we see for the first time students of nature saying that fellow students of nature should arbitrarily limit themselves to natural causes. And while it may be true that God is responsible for things, that is not part of what a natural philosopher or natural historian does. So this codified, in effect, what had been more or less a general practice uh, for uh, quite a long time among uh, students of nature. Now, it's important to note that this was not coming from the atheistic fringe of philosophy or what would soon be known as science, but was coming from people we would regard today as, most of them, as evangelical Christians, even before that term was, was, was widely used. And the reason that this approach to studying nature, that is, limiting oneself to natural causes, was so powerful and so acceptable to devout Christians, was that the search for natural laws, which was the primary goal of doing science, was to discover God's laws in nature. You couldn't invoke God to explain why nature worked this way, but you could certainly use what you found, the regularities of nature, 
to understand God. So you had this growing dichotomy between the practice of science. The practice of science, in doing it, you did not invoke the supernatural. But it was perfectly acceptable for you to go on and talk about the, the God who would have created a world so that things could take place through his ordained uh, natural laws. So there was very little concern, or certainly consternation, uh, about this, this move, and it was largely promoted uh, by believing Christians. So that by the early 19th century, you have two things. You have the invention of science. You and it's, it's quite obvious in the literature, the term natural philosophy, which had a loud God talk, disappears, and more and more the term science is used. Now, scientia, the Latin term for, for science, had been around for millennia, but it referred to knowledge generally. It's only in the beginning of the 19th century that students of nature who would soon come to be called scientists, which is a new, new word as well, uh, began, they captured this term and narrowed it to knowledge of nature rather than knowledge. Now that meant that theology was no longer a science and that did annoy some theologians. <laughs> Uh, who did not let this go without, uh, without comment. But the, the scientists were successful in getting this word uh, to apply primarily to their activities uh, of studying nature. And as the rules for studying nature in science emerged, the number one rule was no appeals to God or Satan. If you appealed to God or Satan to explain the workings of nature, you were, by consensus, going beyond the boundaries of, of science. It didn't have to be that way. Natural philosophy did pretty well up through the time of Newton uh, without that. But science actually did even better by limiting itself uh, to to natural causes. By the mid-19th century, uh, one of the leading Wesleyan scientists in America, William North Rice, was able to say, it is the aim of science to narrow the domain of the supernatural by bringing all phenomena within the scope of natural laws and secondary causes. And he was a devout Wesleyan Methodist, one of the scientific leaders in that community in the second half of the, the 19th century. So that's basically how things came to be separated. There's one more contributing factor that I should mention, and that is that concurrently, especially in the latter part of the 19th century, another process is going on that I have called privatization may not be the best word, but it's the best one that I could come up with. And that is, in scientific writing generally, scientists, and that name is now being used for those who practice science, tried to depersonalize what they wrote. Earlier scientific writings were much more interesting because they were much more personal. But now, with the invention of the so-called scientific method, which is mostly a pedagogical device. It doesn't have any connection with real-world science that I've been able to find. Uh, but you have this scientific method and, and its discovery of truths about nature. And when you write about it, you depersonalize your discovery. So you, you, the, the new scientific rhetoric says you write in the passive voice uh, and you take out the act. So the experiment was performed. You know, there's no subjective human being in, involved in this. 
And uh, that's when scientific writing goes downhill. It's really boring. Uh, and uh, if you've tried reading it, you'll probably understand that. Uh, so that goes hand in hand. Now, by privatization, I don't mean that religious convictions were silenced, but it meant that hand in hand with the commitment to natural explanations went this depersonalization, and you could well or acceptably go off and uh, talk about how the design of nature or the discovery of natural laws convinces you of, uh, of God's existence or something like that. But it was, it was privatized from the practice of science. This was relegated to your religious life and not uh, part of your scientific life. Now, one of the great attractions of this restriction to natural causes, or what we now call methodological naturalism, is that it allowed everybody to play the game of science. <laughs> that since the supernatural was off the table, you could have atheists, of which there were very few at this time, and you could have very conservative Christians all coming together to discuss the evidence for natural laws without appeals to, to the supernatural. And it really leveled the playing field and made science an attractive occupation for people of all religious stripes. And this was hailed by evangelical Christians as a wonderful way for evangelicals to enter into the scientific realm. And it was in the 80s, the early 80s, that a evangelical philosopher and theologian at Wheaton College named Paul DeVries really introduced this term, methodological naturalism, in the Christian Scholars Review as the methodological model for evangelicals. This was a, a wonderful thing. The term we've now found, despite what I've claimed in the past, uh, did appear from time to time in previous decades, but it was DeVries who put it into play in the, in the uh, evangelical uh, community. And so this was welcomed by evangelical intellectuals as a, a way for them to retain their Christian conviction and yet become very active uh, in the world of science. Things really changed in the early 1990s with the appearance of the intelligent design theorists. Led by Philip Johnson, a lawyer at University of California, Berkeley, this initially at least very small community of critics began claiming that methodological naturalism was the equivalent of metaphysical or ontological naturalism. That this was just a rhetorical game to say, oh, in doing science, we will restrict ourselves to natural explanations, but we can believe in God, the devil, whatever, uh, apart from, from science. And that their goal was, as one sympathizer said, to reclaim science in the name of God. Their primary goal from the beginning to the present, has been to reject methodological naturalism and allow, when the evidence warrants, as they say, appeals to the supernatural to count as legitimate uh, science. This, if brought about, would be the second biggest scientific revolution we've ever, we've ever experienced. And I think that helps to explain why 
even in many uh, evangelical and Christian communities, there has been such a resistance. It's not just, oh, we look at the evidence of science and we see evidence of God. Uh, it is an attack on what has become the cardinal methodological principle of, of science. The courts in the United States have declared that. The sure way you can detect what is not science if, is when it appeals to the supernatural. Philosophers of science have said that. Historians of science who don't have much influence have also uh, uh, said that. So we are in a period uh, that nobody really expected uh, two decades ago where the long-established rules for doing science are now under attack by a very vocal, but I think not too large, group of critics. Thank you. 